I'm Brian Bailey, Technical Editor for Semiconductor Engineering. I'm speaking today with David Abercrombie, Advanced Physical Verification Methodology Program Manager at Mentor Graphics. We're going to be discussing some advanced lithography issues. In part one of this series, we'll be looking at the issues of who needs to be aware of and the fundamentals of double patterning. Why do people need to be concerned about double patterning? Well, first of all, uh, in some senses, you don't need to be concerned about it unless you're moving to 20 nanometer technology nodes and below. So any technology design node above 20 nanometers does not require multi-patterning. So in that sense, you don't need to know about it. But if you're even thinking about heading that direction as you move uh, forward in your technology roadmap, I do think it is well worth your time to spend significant uh, time learning ahead of making that move because a lot of decisions that you make very early in the process of migrating a node to that will affect your success uh, in using multi-patterning. So it's worth your time to be educated if you're in any way thinking of heading to those nodes. Um, in terms of why do you even have to deal with this at 20 nanometer, um, it's because it's the only way we found to extend the existing lithography uh, solutions that we have in the manufacturing space to those levels of uh, dimensions that we're using those technology nodes. Uh, because the EUV systems are not yet production ready, there's no other lithography light source available to do to print smaller nodes. And basically what's happened at 20 nanometer is that all the OPC, optical proximity correction tricks that we've been using for years to extend the life of the lithography tools have run out of steam. There's no more tricks we can come up with to get it to uh, to trick the tool into printing what you want it to print successfully. Uh, so basically the idea of multi-patterning is uh, to use the tool, use the lithography tool twice, but in each time you use it there's only half the shapes being printed. And so they're far enough apart, since you're only printing half of them at a time, that you can OPC manipulate the environment around each one sufficiently to get it to print. If you printed them all at once, they're so densely packed, you can't do sufficient OPC to get them to print. Okay? So by separating them into two, you can now get each half of them to print. You just have to print them twice. Maybe you can give us an example of, of uh, something that, that might, might be double patterned. Uh, well, uh, the, the first layers you're going to encounter when you move to the 20 nanometer are going to be your uh, contact and your metal. Low end, uh, front end metal layers. They are the densest uh, layers. Uh, actually, the poly layer is also uh, double patterned uh, using a technique. Uh, it's called line and cut. Uh, so basically, they've restricted your poly layout. You'll see when you get to 20, where you can only draw straight lines. <laughs> Everything is parallel. On a given pitch, it's parallel lines. Uh, and with that severe restriction, uh, they know they can print it by printing every other one, and they already know what color they're going to be. That every one will alternate, and they're just parallel lines. And then to break the line into segments, they use a separate mask to just cut them. Okay, so they can print the lines and then cut them. Uh, it's a two-mask process. The the nice thing about that particular layer, because it's so constrained, is as a designer you don't have to know that that's happening. You just draw straight rectangles with gaps in them. Uh, yeah. And uh, that will uh, assure that uh, they can be converted into these two masks. But you don't have to really deal with the creation of those two masks. Um, but at the contact and metal layers, uh, it actually impacts uh, you specifically as a designer because uh, you either have to yourself draw the two masks, determine which of the shapes are on which mask, uh, or at least verify through special uh, DRC checking that what you have drawn can be uh, converted into two masks. Uh, and that's because those layers are not as restrictive on their layout style as the poly is. It's not just parallel lines. They've still given you freedom on contact in M1 to draw uh, 
a variety, a much more diverse variety of layout styles. Uh, so that's where you'll see it first. But uh, in terms of how that will look to you, uh, we'll, I think it's easiest to start with something simple that you uh, uh, at least understand the concept of double patterning. We'll start with just contacts. Uh, if you have two contacts and they're sufficiently far apart, then there's really no need for double patterning. There's enough space between them that you could put, print them with one mask. Uh, so uh, these are called a situation where they're farther than uh, same mask spacing. They're allowed to be same mask. They can, so this one could be on either mask and this one could be on either, either mask and it really wouldn't matter. However, if you draw another polygon representing a contact very close to another polygon, now these are too close to each other to be printed on the same mask. We can't resolve them simultaneously. They would essentially merge into one shape if you printed them with, the, with one pass. So you have to assign one of them to one mask and one of them to another. This is typically called coloring the layout. So you would take the original drawn shapes, assign one of them to one GDS layer representing one mask, and you would assign the other to a GDS layer representing the other mask. And then all the red shapes in the layout here would be put on one mask and all the orange shapes would be put on another mask. So it seems simple enough. If things are close to each other, they just need to be uh, on opposite mask. Um, the issue comes when you start having more than two involved and whether or not a coloring solution can be uh, generated. So let's, uh, let's extend the example a little bit. Let's say we have four and that uh, the spacing requirements for this uh, will say that those two are forced to be, are too close to be printed. Those are too close. Those are too close. And those are too close. So what do you do? We can see by alternating, since there's an even number, four, this one could be placed on the red mask so it's opposite of the orange. And now this one can be placed on the orange mask, so it's opposite of both the reds. So this is a case of multiple shapes in near proximity to each other that are, from a multi-patterning standpoint, a double patterning standpoint, are legal, meaning they can be easily decomposed into two, two colors. Uh, now one other thing you might ask, well wait a minute, why is this one orange? Why isn't this one red and this one orange? That's a good thing to notice. In fact, this, this coloring solution is also legal. You could color them this way or that way. Either one would be okay, but equally valid from a spacing standpoint because every one that's close to each other is the opposite color of the other one. Uh, so that is the first thing I think that's a little odd to a designer. Most design rules are one way or the other. It either passes the rule or it doesn't pass the rule. There's only one right answer. Okay? And in double patterning, you first encounter the situation where there's more than one right answer. Okay? And that can be a little disconcerting. Is uh, When people look at a layout, they want, they want to be able to know well, what is the answer going to be? Is there a deterministic result? Not necessarily. There may be more than one legally deterministic result. So who decides which one gets used? Well, that's a good question. And it, that partly depends on the flow that the foundry you're using allows you to, forces you or allows you to use. There's basically uh, uh, three types of flows that we see uh, facilitated in the industry. Uh, the first is typically referred to as a colorless flow. A colorless flow, the designer would only draw the original uncolored shapes. Okay? And there are checks special uh, capability in the DRC tools that will go through this process internally of determining whether this could be turned into two masks or not legally and it will say yes or no. And if the answer is yes it can, then this is considered a legal construct and the designer just tapes out this. Now in that flow, the fab then takes this data and they turn it into one of these answers. So in that sense, with this flow, you have no control. Uh, it, it is what they decide to color it. 
They will color it one legal way or the other and do it. You have no control. And that caused an issue for some designers. So um, the first thing we saw happen in foundries using this flow is they slightly modified that flow to have something they call support for anchoring. And, they, and in that they're saying, okay, if in your layout there are certain circuits or uh, pieces of your layout where you do care, you may have some reason to care which answer is provided, well then we'll let you, you specify those. So let's imagine there's a bunch of polygons on my layout and these particular polygons are part of some circuit that I have a reason to care about how they're colored, well then those I can assign to a mask and I want this coloring, not that coloring. Uh, and the rest I don't care, you can do whatever you want. And this is called a partial coloring flow. Uh, most of it's not colored and let the fab decide and parts that I care about uh, I control. Um, and so this is a, a flow that we saw exist. Uh, another flow we see supported by, foundry, by foundries are what we call full color flows, uh, where the designer is told, you do the entire decomposition. You tape out not the green layer, but you tape out the yellow, the orange, and the red layer uh, as the final two masks that you give to us, the two GDS layers that you give to us. And in that case, you would have colored all of the, of the shapes, and you may or may not even have a green original layer. Uh, that's up to you. Um. Thank you, David, and please do remember there will be a part two of this series in which we'll be looking at debugging of patterning errors and more advanced issues such as triple patterning.